So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I have a couple of more announcements. And this coming Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. So we will be gathering um, noon at the courthouse. In the courtyard in the front, so we're going to pray together as the people of God. So if you want to come, you can come and pray with us over there. And uh, it's a really wonderful time. And so I'd like to invite you to come. And also, uh, for this Christmas, we're actually producing a CD. And a Christmas CD. You know? and so, uh, every time you sing on Sundays, it's like you practice. So in, uh, in June sometime, we're going to actually have an audition. You know, and uh, everybody is welcome to come, and everybody must come. And we'll be, we'll be auditioning uh, in front of our, our wonderful singers, you know, Myung, Anna, and Don, and Vanessa. And we're going to have a little fun. We're going to do like a voice style. You know, they're not going to see your face. So you can just sing your voice, put your heart out, you know. And, yeah, I don't sing really well, but then I can scream really loud, you know, and so I'm uh, practicing. And so hopefully uh, we'll get to the people who can sing, and uh, people who sing well, they can stay in front of the um, microphone, so their voice will be loud. People who don't sing really well, they can be a little bit far, and your voice is still in there somewhere. And, uh, and we're doing that to raise money for uh, our mission um, causes in, in our church, so... Uh, please be uh, joining in that effort. Okay, today I'm speaking from Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 34. And my, my glasses are not new, new, but then these are, they call it progressive lens. You know, and so they have um, like one point where it's, it helps, helps me to see really far, but then I, if I look down like this, it helps me to look like something close. But then, it gets out of focus sometimes, you know, so, you know, bear with me when I read these kind of things, like pastors looking weird, and sometimes I go like this, and I have to be like this too, so, you know. Okay, Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 34. Let me read it for you guys, you can kind of follow along. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 34. Someone in the crowd said to him, meaning Jesus, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barn and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain, grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what, uh, what you have prepared for yourself? Uh, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for your, himself, but in, uh, in not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, 
And do not set your hearts on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan would run after all these things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. And all these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses uh, prov provide purses, purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where there is no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there is your heart will be also. You know, I titled this message. I usually don't title it, right? But this one title came to me really strongly as I have to title it. I titled it, In Money We Trust. <laughs> you know, in our money, it's supposed to say, uh, In God We Trust. But I think a lot of times for us, it's not in God that we trust, but it is money that we trust. Did you know that Bible has about, New Testament only has about 500 verses about prayer, and it has about 500 verses about faith, but it has more than 2,000 verses about material and money. In fact, 15% of everything Jesus taught about was on the topic of money and possessions. He taught more about money and possessions than heaven and earth and uh, heaven and hell combined. So he talked about possessions and money a lot, very, very often, 15%. Right? Let's say if I do like 150 sermons, that's 15 sermons. Right? In three years, we gotta, I got to talk about money about 15 times, which I rarely do. You know, because money is very sensitive. I grew up very poor, and now I'm rich. We live in America, right? right? Because we live in America, we're rich. You know, did you know that only 4% of world's population lives in America? But you know how much resources that we use as Americans? Yes, Michael? Yeah, 30%, depend, anywhere between 25 to 33. And it's not 30% of on the bottom. It's the 30% on top. <laughs> right? It's a big difference, right? Which resource do you get to use? The 30% on the bottom or 30% on top? We get to use about one-third of world resources and we only have this 4% of the population. So we are a little bit sensitive about this topic and I think we must be sensitive. Right? And we don't want to just tell people what to do about it because we're dealing with people's lives. We want to deal with, with, with the truth, but also deal with love and gentleness and respect. So from this verse, verses, I want to share with you three R's for you to memorize or remember it very, very easy. Three R's. First R is to resist greed. Resist greed. Everybody say it with me. Resist greed. Right? And I know some of you will automatically say, I'm not greedy. I'm one poor college students. I don't have any money to be greedy. I have nothing. You know, you have your clothes. You spend money. You do. You have a lot of things. You do, right? You have a lot of things. I remember coming to Cal Poly in 1990. I put everything, all my possessions in one car. Right? And as you time, each time you move, what happened? Well, you're going to have to get a 14 footer, you all. And the next one is 17 footer, and the 21 footer, and 23 footer, but now you got the 23 footer twice to move all your stuff. We do have a lot of stuff. We do. Right? And so I know some of us probably say, I'm not greedy. Right? And in your, in your, in your, in your head it's about that. But I think it all depends on who you talk to and who evaluates in the level of our greediness. So like I, saw, I told you, 4% of the world population live in America and we use one-third of the re world resources. If you ask anybody else in this world who does not live in America, they will automatically tell us Americans are greedy. And not because I'm Asian, I, I'm not including myself. I'm, I'm an American. I have American citizenship. We're, we all live here and we are greedy in certain sense. And I want to share with you. And what's the definition of being greedy? Right? It says this in the dictionary. A selfish and excessive desire for more of something as money than is needed. Do you remember? You know what is needed and what you want? There's a big gap, right? We always want stuff. 
Uh, we don't really need stuff. Right? I know John taught me this. He goes like, he taught little kids one day, and he got an iPod. iPad said, do you need iPad? <laughs> and I think my son probably said, yes. <laughs> no, you don't need iPad. Do you need food? Yes, you need food. But you don't need iPad. You don't need phone. Right? I know like some of your phone bill is expensive. 100 bucks. We pay $250 for our five lines, unlimited everything. But it's a good deal, but $250, that's $3,000 a year. <laughs> when I think about that, I said, wow, we, we did without the phone a while ago. But why is it so? Everybody has a phone these days, right? Only a few people. So there's this gap between what we need and what we want. And when you evaluate that, right, not just we evaluating us, but other people evaluating it, and helping us to see, are we really greedy? Are we not greedy? Right? An answer can vary, vary a lot. Right? And so I think we have to be a little bit honest in the ways that... And so in talking about the exalting possessions to a place of importance that is greater than the place that it ought to be. That's what greed means. Right? I know like possession, those things, uh, is being in a place of importance that is greater than where it ought to be. Right? So I think it is important, the things, how do we manage things, right? God created man and woman to be in control of, of things. Right? God said, have dominion over everything. But sometimes, rather than having dominion over things of this world, what happened? We are being domained by those things. We're not the owner of those things. Those things are owner of us. We don't own them, but they own us. Right? Houses own us. Money owns us. So that's uh, exalting possessions to a place more important than where it ought to be. Right? So it's nothing to do with how much you have, how much you don't have. A lot of times we think, oh, those rich people are only, uh, they're greedy. It's not true. Remember I told you we're America, we're all rich. Right? Yes, rich people can be greedy, but also people who do not have a lot of much, you know, things, the poor people can be greedy thing too. Because they, in their mind, and everybody's mind, you know, those possessions, where are they in the order of importance? You, know, you have important things in your life, are they taking place where it ought to be? Or are they taking out in a higher, in higher place in the importance ladder? That, that is very, very important for us to know. So quality, the Bible is saying is this, quality of life is is not proportionate to one's possession. Life is more than what we possess. That's what Bible is saying. Right? Your life does not consist of what you have, what you possess. Having lots of stuff does not make your life better. That's why we go to Mexico in Tijuana and we play with those kids. They have so much fun. They laugh more. They enjoy their life. Right? And a lot of times, just because we have more stuff, it doesn't mean that our life is better. Right? Right? And so, the fulfillment of life, the enjoyment of life is not based on how much you have. So, going back to verse 15, Jesus says this, Watch out! Right? And when you hear that, and a lot of times you use the Bible like, well, okay, watch out. But then, you, do you think how Jesus said it? How, when do you say watch out? When something is in great danger, right? Like when kids are playing and like you know, and they're kicking a ball and ball's going bing, bing, to the street, right? And there's the bounces, and you know exactly where it's gonna bounce. Maybe three bounces later, right down the street. Then you watch out! Ball's not that important, but your life is important. So don't st don't go anywhere. Stop right there, right? And that's why you use watch out these things. So this is a very, very serious thing that Jesus is telling us to watch out. Right? Why? Because we all have this, right? We're prone to being sucked into this materialism. And so he says, watch out. And so the next word is very important. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Right? And so when you think about it, all kinds of greed? Maybe there's only one kind, I thought, but there's all kinds of greed. Well, how many kinds of greed are there? I don't know, but just simply, I, I think I can think about a couple of things. Hoarding, you know, not just hoarding, H-O-A-R-D. You know, my wife has been telling me, like, honey, can you say Jesus right? 
Uh, is it, are you saying G E S U S or J E S U S? I don't know, but then you know, it's hoarding, right? It's not hoarding, but it's hoarding, right? And like hoarding, right? <laughs> but it's not being generous until you have certain amount of stuff or money. So right now I'm just right. People are talking. Let me just gather stuff, and once I have enough, or once I have prepared my nest, then. I can overflow and become more generous to other people. And that's the, the hoarding mentality. Right? Having a lot of stuff first, right? And I think other times, right, it's, it's, it's overspending, like America. You know, we, I think our GDP is like $16 trillion and that's not enough to spend, so we have to borrow money. Right? It's overspending. It's a confusion between wants and need and being in debt, right? Not, Spending what you make, but then <laughs> spending more than what you make. And, and so, Bible says very clearly that being de in debt is no good. Right? The borrower are the slaves to the lender. So overspending and hoarding and comparing. Like, oh, did you see our neighbor got a new minivan? You know? Oh, they got a new Mercedes and you know you gotta keep up with your neighbor, the Joneses, or even competing to your neighbors to show off and did you see my 90 inch TV? You know? Or whatever inch nowadays is, is out, compare them with your with your neighbor. So of course this sense of entitlement. I deserve to have this. I'm an American. We like big things, we like expensive things. Right? Or whatever mentality you have, so we can be greedy having all these things. Right? Having not, not just one game console is enough. You gotta have your Wii, you gotta have your Wii U, you gotta have your PS3, PS4, right? Is it PS5 out yet? Well, anyway, you know, whatever you have. You have so many different things, and how many games can you play at once? Like four, three things at one time? This ain't no piano, right? You only play one thing at a time. Why we need so many? I'm talking about myself. I have Wii. I have PS3. You know? And we have all kinds of phones that you can play games on and stuff. Yeah. And sometimes we view money as security, status, things that you can enjoy life or having control over. Right? And that's very, very dangerous. So how many kinds of greed? There's many, many different kinds. And it can attack us. It can put us into this fall or this pit in many different ways. Right? And so, I think God is telling us is that wrong understanding will lead you to a wrong life. So we've been taught wrong. Right? I, I remember how we were taught is, oh, most, right, people who die with most toy wins about life. How do you know you have a successful life or how do you know how you won? How do you win? Have most toys. Right? When you have lots of stuff, then you win in life. That's a wrong Wrong teaching. We gotta renew our mind. It's not how much you have determines if you live a successful life or not. It's not like that at all. And so we were taught incorrectly. It's not what more you have, it gives you an important you are or better life. It's not like that at all. The Bible stuff tells us that simply we are stewards. You are a manager of everything. Nothing belongs to us, but God entrusts us with stuff. And how we use this stuff, right, must reflect the nature of God, God's glory. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. How do we live? We live to glorify God. Every opportunity that you have, we live to reflect, reveal the nature of God. Does, does it make sense? It's not for ourselves. You are, I mean, even this very breath that God has given us, it's not for you to enjoy life. Right? We were there last Friday and we're talking to this person and she didn't really like us, how we preach Christ over there. And, you know, and she was kind of lecturing us. And, and, and you know, last five minutes I was listening to this lady and talking to our team. And the only thing she talked about is enjoy. God wants me to enjoy this life. And I got kind of fed up, right? You know, I, I like to fight about those things, you know? I said, excuse me. You know, I was over there like five minutes, and the only thing you talked about is enjoying life. You think God just, you know, your God's number one purpose is for you to enjoy your life? So when you put it that way, they go like, mm, maybe, maybe not, right? <laughs> right? And I told her, our life,
life God has given us, our life God has entrusted us, this very breath, the, the talents that you have, the time, the treasure, right? The truth to God, the testimonies that you have, God has given you to glorify Him. Our number one concern, our number one aim, our goal is not just for you to enjoy your life. Your, your goal is to glorify Him. And through that, you get to enjoy life. Right? right? And that's the Westminster Confession. It's a short one anyway. Right? Glorify God. Enjoy Him. Enjoy Him. Not just enjoy the things of this world. So we are stewards. God has entrusted us. And how we use this life. I'm not saying don't have fun, but while you have fun, you can reflect the glory of God, God's nature as well. And we must evaluate often. See our aim. Where is it going? You know, I, I used to be a little crazy. I still am a little bit once in a while. So when I was in college, we, we would play this game. Don't ever play this game. It's not good for you. Right? We'll go on the freeway and we'll close our eyes. And how long can we go on the freeway without like, opening your eyes? And, yeah, you know, and you can see, oh, yeah, pastor is crazy. Yeah, that was, that was before I got saved. You know, praise the Lord, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and seriously, yeah. You know, and so what, what happened? You have to open your eyes when you drive. And constantly you got to like, what? Uh, you got to steer. This ain't no Google car you go by yourself. And our life is like that. You must often evaluate where our life's going. Where am I living for? What is inside of my heart regarding possessions? Am, am I a hoarder? Right? Am, am I an overspender? Do I, am I comparing with other people? And somebody buys a new car and I want to buy a new car? Or, or they buy a new TV or I want to buy a new TV? Right? Or do I think about all these things? I deserve to have all these things. And then how is my giving? How do I practice generosity to the causes of God and reflecting glory of God? And that's what I was saying. Watch out! You gotta feel this intensity that Jesus is saying. It's on the red letters, right? It's written with Jesus' blood, telling us, watch out! Be on guard. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. So we must resist greed. And don't just, you know, just pass on by and say, I'm not greedy. Ask God, God, show me what part of my life reflects greed. What part of my life does not reflect your nature? How am I greedy? Jesus is telling us, watch out. Be on guard, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Not just one way of greed, but all kinds of this greed. Show me. Resist greed. That's the first R. Second R is re-examine treasure. Re-examine treasure. So treasure, right? So it's like saying, okay, what's my treasure? What do I treasure in my life? Right? You know, what, 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 is, what, are, what is treasure? Treasure is what you look at. What you look at. Uh, I know guys, we, we like girls, right? And I, I, sometimes I'll be sitting in the back and, you know, car, and I see two guys, right, you know, my buddies, and there's a little driver, and usually there's college students, I go by, you know, and there's a kid, driver and a passenger, and many, many, many times, we, uh, there's a red light, we stop, right? And there's, you know, we're in we're a college town, so there's a lot of girls walking around, and, and it's so funny, their head is like the radar, right? And then the woman walking in the street, you know, they go like, <laughs> you know, you know? And sometimes I'll be talking with them, right? And their, their head moves, and I always look back, you know, right? And sure enough, there's somebody, right? But yeah, it's, what, do you, what do you look at? That's your treasure. What do you think about? What consumes your time and your focus? That's your treasure. Do you think about God? Do you think about like, oh man, I think of my quiet time today. I didn't, I didn't pray, Lord. You know, do you think about that? Or do you think about, you know? What do you think about? Right? And, and what do you desire to be filled with? Your desires. What do you long for? You know what I'm saying? What do you think about and what do you look at and what do you are, are you consumed with and want you what do you want to be filled with? And where do you find beauty? <coughs> what do you find? Wow, that's so beautiful. That's so wonderful. What do you find value? And you know, this is very important. What do you find your worth when you have it? And sometimes we're very materialistic when you say, man, if I get that car. If I get that Samsung Note 
10, you know, and, and if I be using that in the street, I'd be like, if I get that Apple iPhone, you know, 29, and you know, which is numerously long or something, you know, I'll be so popular amongst my friends. Right? What, what, sometimes we think like, oh, if I have this, I will find my worth in that. I will be important if I have this. You find your worth in the position. And, and, and this is very, very shocking. He said, you know, treasure is something that you want to die for. Are you willing to die for? You're going to spend your life to get this treasure. You know what I'm saying? That's what it is. Treasure is something that you're willing to spend your life. That's something that you're willing to <coughs> die for. You know, we are slaves to what we treasure. Did you know that? You are a slave to what you treasure. You are driven by what you treasure. And you define success by what you treasure. It is so right. And that's why God talks about your heavenly treasure versus your earthly treasure. What's the heavenly? What's, what's the earthly treasure? Right? It, it's about the, the world treasure, what the world thinks is very important. What you have, possession. It's all start with P. Position. Possession, position, prestige, and power. Right? That's something that we all want. And what's the heavenly treasure? What did God treasure? What does God value? What is God's desire? And like I said, treasure is something that you die for. What was God willing to die for? What? Romans 5a. God demonstrated His love for us, yet we were sinners. While we were sinners, Christ came and died for us. You know why? Because we are His treasure. You know, that really blows my mind. When I think about that, like, wow, God treasures me? That's what the Bible says, that we are His possession, right? God values us. God loves us. God cares for us. God thinks that we're very, very important. And God was willing to die for us. That's how important we are in the kingdom of God. Right? Sinners like us before we came to save. Right? Why? Because without God dying for us, without God loving us, we will perish. Right? John 3, 16. For God so loved this world. God so loved this world. He gave His begotten Son. And whoever believes in Him shall not perish. Perish! If God doesn't love us, if God didn't save us, if God didn't deliver us, we will perish forever and ever. It's not a temporal perish. It's perishing forever and ever. And without God dying for us and delivering us, we will perish forever. That's why God came and died and provided salvation for us. He's saying the people are important. People are important. The same people, right? In our relationship, we, we correct them, we teach them, we train them, we rebuke them, just like the Word of God. Same people are important. And unsaved people are important too. That's why we preach Christ. We respect them, we honor them, we love them, we show them love. We're gentle with them, right? It's not just all about showing love, and, and that's why people get confused. Not just showing love, yeah, it's showing love, but it's telling love too. <laughs> It's telling about Christ. So people are very, very important. God's treasure was people. Because people last forever. What lasts forever is important. Say that. What lasts forever is important. Things doesn't last that. Right? You know, I know some of you guys have old phones, like a brick phone, like I use it as a weapon. Right? And, right, and you're just praying that that will die someday and you could get an upgrade. Right? Yeah. Doesn't last that long. Right? But remember when it came out though? Like, wow, this was so cool. But it lasts like maybe five years later. It doesn't, it, it, the value is not there. What lasts forever, what lasts forever is important. And so people are very, very important. And so we need to repent. That's not one of my R's. You know, when you re examine your treasure, oh my goodness, I have not been treasuring people. To me, people are not as important as things. 
You, you can do this test simply. Uh, you just think about the best restaurant. It could be your house. You could be like, you know, I don't know what restaurant that you guys go, Thai boat or, you know, or whatever, right? And you think about, okay, if you need to describe the restaurant to people, what would you say? And then you look at the description. And when you look at the description, you say, oh, my goodness, I value things. Over. Oh, they give you a lot of food. You value things. Right. Oh, the atmosphere is really good. Okay, you know, maybe half and half. Right. Oh, it's great takes place where you take people to. Because they give you a lot of food. Okay, then you value people. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes, well, you don't know what's in your heart until it kind of comes out. Then you examine it. And, oh my goodness, I don't value people. I only value things. Right. So you need to understand, we need to repent. Changing your mind and changing your heart. What you treasure, what you're willing to die for. And, you know, and be converted of what God wants you to treasure, your heavenly treasure. And what's heavenly treasure? It's God and people. Because God lasts forever. He's eternal God. And people's soul lasts forever. That's why when you treasure God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and we treasure God's people, saved and unsaved as well. So on top of treasuring people, saved people, and unsaved people, and appropriately loving them, my third R is this, return to Christ as our number one treasure. Say that with me. Return to Christ as our number one treasure. So what was first R? Resist greed. Second R, re-examine treasure. Third R, is return to Christ as our number one treasure. Yeah. For He is worthy. Who is Jesus? He is the Creator. He is the Redeemer. He is the Lord of the Lords and the King of the Kings. You know, and when we treasure Jesus as our number one treasure, you will see these three changes that this Bible talks about. And Bible keeps saying, do not fear, do not fear, right? So when you treasure Jesus as your number one treasure, and I'm not talking about uh, Jesus is number one treasure right here, and number one, number two treasure, which is like, you could be whatever you want, and they're so close, you can't even tell sometimes. I'm not talking about number one, number two like that. I'm talking about number one and number two is like way down there. Right? We're talking about supremely number one that, that Jesus must be our treasure. Okay? In that. So when you live like that, you see these three changes in the text that you can see there. You have no fear. You will not fear these temporal things. You have confidence in Him for He treasure us. For He is our Heavenly Father. When you are loved by God, when you are treasured by God, when God says, you are mine. Oh, I love that. When Elaine said yes to me, said, you are mine. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I belong to somebody, you know? Right, you college students who are not married, don't you wonder? Like, high school students too? Like, man, will anybody love me? Will you, anybody want to marry me? You know, I heard good-looking girls and good-looking guys think about it too. I have a friend who looks like Tom Cruise. And I said, man, you look like Tom Cruise. He used to hate that. <laughs> I'm like, I wish I looked like a Tom Cruise, man. You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they wonder about these things too. They wonder about, will anybody love me? Will anybody will say yes to me for me to get married and have family? They live in fear. But understanding that God treasure us. Understanding that God says, you are my possession, you are prized, you are my apple of my eyes. I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds really good, right? When God says, you are my apple, you know what it means, right? Yeah. You are apple of my eyes. Right? When you are loved by God, and when you love Him, the perfect love chase away fear. When God loves you, when you love God with all your heart, Fear goes away because all the things that we're experiencing right now is temporal. But have confidence because our goal is not in this world, but the world to come, the eternal life. You overcome fear. The second thing you overcome is worry. You know, we worry a lot, right? We do, oh, my daughter's going to high school next year. Oh, Lord. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit worrying. You know, so not just having confidence, but having peace. Because God, again, God is in perfect control of all things, of everything. And we can find rest in Him. 
and experiencing this peace from the Lord. And the Bible says, the peace I give unto you is not the peace of this world. Right? I, I think what, what it means is that there is no little peace that can come from the world. And, but the Jesus is saying, it's not like the peace from the world, the peace I give unto you. And Philippians 4, 6 says, right, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And this is my favorite part. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our heart, our, your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. We will have no worries. Our worries will be contained in the Lordship of Christ and we can experience this peace transcends all understanding will guard your heart and guard your mind. Right? And, and, you know, I have to go with three things, right? So no fear, no worry, and like, oh Lord, what's the next no? Right? Because everything good has comes in three, you know? <laughs> I say, okay, no common life. Common life. Common life, casual life, right? And again, no common life means what? Holy life. We are commanded to live a holy life, separated life. Right? We're not just living in this world as whatever, like the way the world lives. We're not to be, right? We're in the world, but not of the world. But we're in the world reflecting glory of God in every opportunity that we get. How do we do that? How do we not live a common life, but live a holy life? You live a life in relationship with God. Right? In reading His words, in quiet time, in praying, and making disciples of all nations, and going mission to all over the world. And there's so many Bible verses. Right? Genesis 12, talking about the Abraham, he says, Well, you know, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to the world. It is true. America does a lot of good things. And one thing that, you know, God blesses America so that we can be a bigger channel to the world. Right? This, you know, this thing happened in Nepal, the earthquake, right? The tsunamis and these dangerous things happening all over the world. It is true. God has blessed America so that we can be this channel of blessing. Right? And Bible also talks about in Philippians 2, it says, don't just look at your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Matthew 5, 48 says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. When I read that for the first time, I said, oh my goodness, our aim is not your pastor, your aim is not your Sunday school teacher, your aim is not to somebody, the holy person you know. Your aim is your heavenly Father. You are to mimic Him. For He is our Heavenly Father. For He is perfect. Like Father, like Son. Amen? You are to be like God. He is perfect. He is complete. So we ought to be perfect in our growing relationship with Him. You know, First Peter talks about this too. It says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as... He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Did you know that Bible is in there? This is in there in the Bible. Be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your life as strangers here, strangers here, because it's a very temporal place. In reverent fear. What's fear? It means having utmost concern. Utmost concern for God. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life. Right? right? And, and God has given us by his, with His precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. And so God is giving us a little glimpse of how we are to live. What does it mean by living a holy life? He said, live like Christ. That Jesus valued us. Jesus valued people. And we are to value what Jesus valued. Who Christ died for. Where we are to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Did you know that? Bible is in the 1st John 3.16 says that. Not just John 3.16, but 1st John 
So last week, <coughs> praise the Lord, you know, the whole international people came and they did a little presentation about sponsoring kids. And I was, I, I, I didn't know he was going to do that. But then when he did that, I was kind of thinking like, oh, I wonder how many people are going to get sponsored, you know? Yeah. And But I think at least 15 children got sponsored. Hallelujah. That's $450 a month. That God is blessing us and we're blessing the world, the people you know, in the world. You know, I heard we're going, we're going three places this summer for missions. We're going to the Philippines. We're going to Tijuana, uh, the city of Angel, the or orphanage, and the other church that we usually go to, the Central Shalom. Right? And going to the Philippines costs a lot of money. I know Mark's family is going, and Trent and Joanne, they're going to go. I know some other people's interested in going, but I know it's, uh, it's expensive. It's almost $2,000. And you know, when you go by yourself, that's $2,000. But when you go as a family, Right? That's like, you know? And I was talking to Mark, and Mark, that's our boat, man. That's our boat money, man. You're just gonna, you know, spend it. You know, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of money. But we're spending it, not, not like the people in the world, but we spend it for the glorifying God, making His name known all over the world. That they will live in the perishing world. It's going to go away. All your money is going to be zero someday. Right? You know, you know how, much, how rich Elvis was? Do you know how much he left when he died? I don't know, but every penny of it. He didn't take anything with him. <laughs> <laughs> when you die, your bank account is going to be zero. Use it for the glory of God. Holy life. So we should raise money for these guys to go to the Philippines. And people who want to go, but they just cannot afford. Yeah, we should. I was so convicted about last week. This holy life. You know, there's this letter I want to read to you, and I'm going to be. There's no clock, so I, I don't know when I need to finish, but I'm, I'm done right here. You know, this is late 2nd century, and it's a letter to the tutor of emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Right? And so somebody's writing a letter to these people. And, See, they, they, this is a, it really depicts the life of a Christian, a holy life, right? And this letter is pretty long, but the part of it says this. They have a common table, but not a common bed, right? You understand know, you know what that means, right? They, they didn't sleep around. You watch soap opera these days, right? You watch one month and next month, and all the partner changed. You know, and next month later, everybody changed. They didn't, they didn't do that, right? And it's a very sacred bed they, they, should, they didn't share. But they had a common table. They invite people to eat with them. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. These are non-Christian people writing about Christians. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the law by their lives. They love all men and they are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, yet abound in all. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil, evil are spoken of, and yet are justified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. Yet punished, or when punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greek. Yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. That's some powerful life. Second century. And, and, and the calling goes same for us. Are you, are we living this separated life, a holy life? And I think we really need to do some examining in our lives. And the Bible is telling us Watch out! There's greed, all kinds of greed. So we need to resist that greed. Reevaluating treasure 
and treasuring what God treasures and return to Christ as our number one treasure, living a holy life for His glory. Amen? Amen? So let's live a generous life. Let's support our mission teams. You know, let's offset parts, a little bit of cost to go to the Philippines. You know, and Joanne and Ryan, I know Ricky wanted to go, right Ricky? Now, now he has to kind of think about it now. <laughs> well, he told me. Yeah, yeah. But I know a lot of you probably want to go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let's be generous. I'm not taking any offering for them right now. For you to think about it. How do I live this holy life? Amen? Amen. So resist greed. Re-examine your treasure. And treasure what God treasures. Right? And return to Christ as our number one treasure. Do you love Jesus? Amen? Amen. 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 Do you love Jesus? Because by the way, He treasures you. And let's love Him. Let's live. Right? To reflect His love for us. As a prayer to As we take our hands. Ushers, come, can you come forward? Lord God, we thank you so much for giving us this wonderful day, this wonderful text, reminding us, convicting our hearts that what we really treasure and how that is compared to what you treasure. Father, we want to repent, change our mind, change our heart to treasure what you treasure in our lives, Father. Father, we know your infinite worth and infinite value. And we want to value you. We want to treasure you as our King, as our Lord. And we want to live this life as separated one, as a called one. Father, thank you for speaking to us. Receive maximum glory from us as we live this holy life. In Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. All rise. Father, we want to treasure you above everything else. Not just a little bit above, but immensely above everything else in this world. For you are worthy. And you are God. You are the Lord of lords and King of kings. Father, we thank you so much for your revelation this morning. Continue to commit our hearts and reorient our hearts so that we can treasure the right things. We can treasure right things, the people and you, the way you want us to treasure you and others around us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 May God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Oh, okay. No, go ahead. Thank you.
Okay.